Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture on Social Justice. By coming to you virtually, we enable more people to hear from our very special guest, Alexis McGill Johnson. She will join in conversation with our own Dorothy Roberts, the George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology. My thanks to Professors Camille Charles and Margot Crawford and the talented team at the Center for Africana Studies for organizing this event. Our gratitude also to the Provost's Office and the Annenberg School for Communication for supporting this important lecture. In 1966, Dr. King spoke in Chicago before the Medical Community for Human Rights. A journalist asked him where healthcare fit into his message about social justice. Dr. King's answer was that healthcare is this most notorious expression of segregation of all the forms of inequality Injustice in health is the most shocking and the most inhuman because it often results in physical death. Women's health forms the foundation of human health and family health. Four foundational principles of social justice make this clear. First, justice demands equity. Equity means a fair distribution of life-sustaining resources. Second, justice requires access. Access means that no one is denied health care because of age, race, religion, sexual orientation, and of course, gender. Third, justice requires participation. Every person should be able to directly participate in critical decisions that affect their lives. And fourth and finally, justice protects rights. Rights protect every person's freedoms, including freedom of conscience. Our speaker today leads an organization that has fought on behalf of the health rights of women for over a century. Planned Parenthood is dedicated to helping people live full and healthy lives, regardless of their income, gender identity, sexual orientation, race, insurance, or immigration status. Please join me in extending the warmest welcome to a champion of the vital idea that women's rights are human rights. Alexis McGill Johnson. Welcome everyone. I join President Gutman in stressing the critical importance of equal access to healthcare as a fundamental human right. At this moment, when a woman's right to choose appears dangerously imperiled, the work of Planned Parenthood is more critical than ever. Family planning services that include sex education, prenatal care, infertility treatment, and treatment for sexually transmitted diseases, as well as vaccinations and cancer screenings for millions of mostly low-income and rural women. Like Dr. King, Margaret Sanger, who founded Planned Parenthood, was in, imprisoned ostensibly for her actions, but in reality, like him, for her beliefs. Also like Dr. King, she was perceived as a threat to a status quo of inequality and injustice. And the two share more than that. Their legacies demonstrate there can be no complacency. No victory in the battle against injustice can be taken for granted. The fight for equal treatment and equal rights continues. It's a battle that Planned Parenthood and its leader, Alexis McGill Johnson, know all too well. Thank you for being with us today. And now John Jackson, Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication will introduce our participants. Hello, my name is John Jackson, Richard Perry University Professor and Walter H. Annenberg Dean of the Annenberg School for Communication here at the University of Pennsylvania. And it's my pleasure to represent the Annenberg School in our ongoing partnership with Africana Studies around this important lecture series, the Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice. And this 2022 lecture brings together, I think, spaces that have become really important areas for discussion here at Penn, which is the nexus between research and scholarship and social practice and policy. Uh, how do we create scholarly spaces that are engaged in the real world that matter to people's everyday lives? And the interlocutors we have today are shining examples of both the merits of doing that kind of work well, um, but also of the benefits that accrue to communities, to society, when folks take seriously the relationship between substantive research practice and social policies that affect people's lives in positive ways. And so on that note, 
without further ado, I want to introduce our two main speakers for today. The first is Alexis McGill Johnson. She's president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America and the Planned Parenthood Action Fund. Planned Parenthood provides vital health services to 2.4 million people each year through more than 600 health centers across the country. Planned Parenthood's vision is a world of equity where sexual and reproductive rights are basic human rights, where access to healthcare doesn't depend on who you are or where you live, and where every person has the opportunity to choose their own path to a healthy and meaningful life. She's a champion for social and racial justice, a respected political and cultural organizer, and a tireless advocate for reproductive freedom. She's been in Planned Parenthood's leadership for more than a decade as Planned Parenthood Federation of America board chair and a Planned Parenthood Action Fund board member. A researcher by training, she co-founded and co-directed the Perception Institute, a consortium of researchers, advocates, and strategists who translate cutting edge mind science research on race, gender, ethnic, and other identities into solutions that reduce bias and discrimination and drive equity and belonging. She's also a thought leader on brain science and narrative change and has written extensively on equity, race, and culture. She's a frequent contributor in the press and a sought after keynote speaker and currently serves on the boards of Color of Change, Leadership Conference for Civil and Human Rights and is a founder of the Culture Group. She holds degrees from Princeton and Yale universities and has taught political science at both Yale and Wesleyan universities. And she's a proud mom of two daughters. She'll be speaking today with Dorothy Roberts. Dorothy is the 14th Penn Integrates Knowledge Professor and George A. Weiss University Professor of Law and Sociology here at the University of Pennsylvania with joint appointments in the Departments of Africana Studies and Sociology and the Law School, where she's the inaugural Raymond Pace and Sadie Tanner Mosel Alexander Professor of Civil Rights. She's also founding director of the Penn Program on Race, Science, and Society, an internationally recognized scholar, public intellectual, and social justice advocate. Roberts has written and lectured extensively on race, gender, class, inequity in US institutions and all around the world. He's been a leader in transforming thinking on reproductive justice, child welfare, and bioethics. She's author of Killing the Black Body, Race, Reproduction, and the Meaning of Liberty, first published in 1997 and reissued in 2017, which was instrumental in launching the reproductive justice movement, as well as Shattered Bonds, The Color of Child Welfare, Fatal Invention, How Science, Politics, and Big Business Recreate Race in the 21st Century, and Torn Apart, How the Child Welfare System Destroys Black Families, and How Abolition Can Build a Safer world, which will be released later this year. We have two really powerful speakers who I know are going to teach us a lot today at that intersection between substantive research contributions and vital social change. Enjoy. Alexis McGill Johnson, I can't tell you how thrilled I am about this opportunity to discuss the state of reproductive policy and politics with such a prominent leader in the field. Thank you so much for joining us. And may I call you Alexis? Oh, please do, uh, Professor Roberts. Um, if uh, I might also uh, just share how excited I am to be here with you. Killing the Black Body was uh, so seminal in my kind of formative uh, coming of age of really making meaning of, of what it meant in a contemporary sense to be uh, a Black woman in this era. So I'm, I'm just delighted to be in conversation with you. Oh, well, thank you for those kind words, and please call me Dorothy. <laughs> okay. So as you just indicated, I've been working for reproductive justice for more than three decades now, and I can recall participating in tons of forums over those years where the question was something like, will Roe be overturned or reproductive rights in a post-Roe world? 
But the possibility that we might actually be at that point seems more real now than ever before. I'd like to begin by asking you, what are the stakes now for our health, our lives and freedom at this moment? You know, the reality of, of, of living in a post-war world uh, has never been uh, more clear right now. I think we are, um, you know, uh, just finishing the, the anniversary of Rose's 49th birthday. And I say that as someone who's 49 herself. Um, and I think a lot of us are wondering whether or not this is this is her last birthday. Um, you know, attacks on abortion rights, restrictive bans, there it's nothing new. But right now, there are um, you know, essentially one ban in Texas, uh, which is uh goes by uh SB8, Senate Bill 8, which is a six-week ban with a bounty hunter provision. Uh, that is an enforcement mechanism that was explicitly designed to evade judicial review. And the Supreme Court has allowed it to stay in effect for four months now. So when you think about the impact in Texas, essentially that means that for the last four months, um, you know, Roe has been rendered meaningless in a state, in the state as large as Texas. And we also have uh, uh, oral arguments finished in uh, a case called Dobbs versus Jackson Women's Health Organization which is a 15 week ban in Mississippi. Uh, so it's no longer a matter of, of if, um, I think it's actually a matter of when uh, Roe is either gutted or overturned. For those of you who listened to the oral arguments, you know what you heard very clearly in December was a majority of justices who seemed poised to at least let the Mississippi 15 week ban stand. And uh, also a, a simple majority of justices uh, who um, were contemplating outright whether or not Roe should be repealed. And so either way, uh, we have never been closer to losing such a fundamental constitutional right. Um, and that is the reality that we are facing right now, where 26 states um, could possibly within inside of a year uh, see um, significant restrictions on access to abortion that could affect upwards of 36 million people. Yeah, very, very frightening and dire. Can you explain for people who may be not as familiar as we are with the US Supreme Court's decisions in the past, how could we get to this point where even though the right to terminate a pregnancy was upheld as a constitutional right in Roe versus Wade, so many people are unable to access abortion services already. What's been going on that has caused this effective overturning of Roe? As you mentioned, even if the court doesn't full out declare that Roe is overturned, yeah. there still are these enormous restrictions. How, how did we get to that point? I mean, you know, it is, it, you know, as I said, Roe is 49 years old. And for the last 49 years, um, the assaults uh, against the right, as soon as, as we gain the right to, uh, to self-determination, to um, make a decision about whether or not and when uh, we would uh, become parents um, was under attack. And so, you know, what Roe did was uh, it, 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 it essentially made, um, uh, made the right um, based on whether or not, um, you know, who had the decision-making power pre-viability. And it has always been our decision to make uh, that decision um, pre-viability, at which point uh, state interests would, would uh, come in. And what we have seen over the last, um, you know, uh, 50 years essentially um, has been um, a, a fight at every turn uh, to, um, to attack uh, some of the, uh, the other core premises under which uh, Roe you know, rests. Privacy, you know, um, uh, as I mentioned, uh, pre-viability, um, as well as a burden, right? The, the burden of, of exercising the right that we also see come into play during Planned, Par Planned Parenthood versus Casey, right? The notion that uh, if we have a right to access abortion, 
uh, if we have the right to abortion, we should also have the right to access abortion and in our state and in our zip code. And uh, the anti-abortion movement has um, been extremely effective in uh, essentially weaponizing each of those premises under which the right is held um, and, and designing legislation uh, that has been taken up in state houses across the country that would, you know, various turns limit access. They have, um, you know, um, attacked doctors admitting privileges. They have created restrictions um, related to uh, to where and how abortion can be performed in um, in what kind of health centers. Uh, you know, down to the width of the hallway um, that is required to receive two, you know, pills of uh, mifepristone and misoprostol. Um, so the laser focus of the anti-abortion movement on creating um, really uh, what, what are called um, trap laws, targeted restrictions against abortion providers, because no other uh, provider, medical provider experiences uh, this level of, of restriction. Um, you know, over the years, uh, these these bans and restrictions have been introduced, and we have, have uh, as a movement, relied on the court system to essentially uh, strike down um, these bans uh, so that people could uh, continue to have access, um, you know, in the state and in the zip code where they live. Uh, and what's happened in particular over the last 10 years uh, we have seen a dramatic shift in our uh, political structure. It started uh, with the 2010 census, um, when um, not only did uh, the redistricting um, transform the Congress as we know it today, it also transformed a number of state houses across the country uh, and essentially put a tyranny of the minority, I would argue, uh, in charge of the levers of power. Uh, there is no state where banning abortion or restricting abortion is popular. Um, the, the majority of people believe that we should have um, access to abortion under Roe. And yet there are uh, a number, more than half of our states are now uh, states that are, you know, anti-reproductive health states um, because you have a number of small small group of, of vocal legislators, a vocal minority who are really um, pulling the, the, the levers of power and holding their citizens hostage. Just last year alone, we had 600 restrictions introduced. Um, and so, uh, you know, when you look at, at what's happened over the last 10 years in the state legislatures, and then you add on the layer of what has happened in the court structure and the court system in the last four years under Mitch McConnell and Donald Trump, um, where they essentially weaponize their own rules change to push through a majority of uh, activist judges on this issue all the way uh, to the three appointees on the Supreme Court. And so we are here today because the courts have, you know, in many ways been our backstop, um, stopping these uh, restrictions as they should be on our uh, constitutional rights. And yet, because of the ways in which they have been um, uh, politicized, and I would argue um, uh, delegitimized, um, they, we are now facing um, this uh, catastrophe and crisis. Yeah, that's a, a really thorough explanation of how this crisis was created on multiple fronts, not only the U.S. Supreme Court allowing states to impose these multiple restrictions, hundreds of restrictions, in the Casey decision that I am always just shocked by the idea that you have a constitutional right, but states are allowed to do whatever they want to create burdens to you exercising your right as long as it's not undue. That is a very strange way of interpreting the, a, a constitutional right. And also early on, very shortly after Roe was decided, the Supreme Court said that states, the federal government and states could deny public assistance for abortion. So already you had early on the de effective denial to many, many people of uh, really being able to access abortion. And then as you pointed out, these anti-democratic measures in state legislatures to 
really undo the will of the people, which would not be as extreme as the measures we're seeing pass. So it, it really is the basis of a catastrophe. Who are affected the most by these restrictions? They, they're written into state laws. And as you said, we may see the overturning of Roe, which would allow for even more of them. Who are the people who are most affected by these restrictions on access to abortion services? It, it's, it's the people who are always most affected by uh, laws that, um, you know, that restrict access to rights. It, it's going to be uh, black and brown um, women, uh, trans communities, non-binary communities, LGBTQ communities, low-income communities, indigenous uh, people of color, folks who uh, already are existing outside of, uh, you know, of our, um, you know, society's structures of, of support. Uh, they're the people who always, uh, who, as, as you mentioned, um, you know, with the passing of the, the uh, Hyde Amendment rules, uh, which restricted act, you, the use of uh, Medicaid for uh, abortion services, you know, it, it continues to, um, to, to further impact uh, communities that already have so little access to uh, to healthcare broadly, right? Um, inside of the public infrastructure, you know, and we're seeing it right now, Dorothy. Right, we're seeing it right now in Texas. Uh, we have patients who are, you know, um, finding out at you know five and a half weeks that they can no longer uh, get an appointment inside of Texas um, to get uh, to get access. And again, in most cases, uh, access to medication abortions, just taking two pills to induce a, a miscarriage. We're seeing patients who are coming in who um, have to take off work, right? They have to get child hair because the majority of people who, who seek access to abortion are already parents. They know exactly what is entailed in bringing in um, their child. There are people who have to, you know, perhaps travel with their elderly parents through COVID, um, thousands of miles from Texas to Oklahoma, Texas to New Mexico. In some cases, we've seen patients as far as um, California, Oregon, Maine, New York, um, because of the impact of this particular ban uh, on the rest of the country and the, you know, um, the uh, provision of abortion broadly. We're seeing patients, um, at one patient who was traveling, um, you know, from Texas to Oklahoma on one of these long, lonely trips and um, was pulled over by the police because she was in a rental car wondering where she was going boyfriend uh, uh, was black or is, is black. Um, and she didn't know what to do in the moment, right? She didn't know, am I supposed to tell him that I, you know, I'm, I'm going to Planned Parenthood? Am I supposed to tell him why? You know, I didn't have all of the answers, you know, um, at my fingertips and I was nervous because now I'm intersecting, you know, with the, with the, the criminalization, right? Potentially of, of seeking access to abortion. So we are seeing it, um, the overlay in so many different ways. And, um, you know, and, and again, it is always the, you know, again, the, the, the canary in the, um, you know, in the coal mine, if I might uh, invoke our late sister uh, uh, Lonnie Bonier, that I think is is um, is the most vulnerable. Um, but but what happens that canary is is really the the future of what will happen to all of us in, in terms of um, how we might access. Yeah, that's a a really frightening picture of the kind of surveillance and policing that will surround people. Now you mentioned the Texas law that gives power to individuals uh, to report on women who have abortions and uh, that kind of deputizing of our neighbors to report on us and then criminal law enforcement as well, not knowing exactly what rights you have, what's considered a crime. It adds a whole layer of this intense kind of surveillance by the state and by agents deputized by the state that I think many people might not think about these, these ways in which there are reverberations beyond the decision to terminate a pregnancy that affects the nature of our relationships with each other and the government. These are really yeah. widespread effects. Yes, I mean, think about it because the the incentive that is built into that bounty 
is $10,000 per abortion, right? So $10,000 and you can be sued by multiple people across that you don't even have to live in the state of Texas, right? So $10,000, the incentive structure, I can think, you know, of, you know, former friends, some family members who would be incentivized by, you know, uh, you know, um, sharing information, private information about what, uh, you know, what uh, a patient or I was experiencing. Like, I, I just think that we, the, the way in which the Texas law is constructed is, is deliberately designed to evade judicial review, right? Because if, if the state were to enforce it, uh, we could we could very clearly, very simply go to the you know to the to state court, district court, to up to the Supreme Court, and it would be struck down because you know it would be a, in very clear violation of an existing uh, law um, uh, protection that we have under Roe. And so they created this mechanism in, designed intentionally um, to increase the surveillance, and and the impact of it has had a, an incredibly chilling effect. You know, everyday workers, people, nurses, people who live on the front line, people who are security guards, you know, your um, your Uber driver, you know, they're, they're all people who who under the span of this very broad, um, you know, no one knows how to, it will be enforced law is now setting up a patchwork of surveillance. And we are seeing that in our in our in our parking lots. We're seeing people take pictures of our license tags of people um, walking into the clinics of, you know, and we don't know where it ends. Are they following people home? You know, these are the things that are um, incredibly distressing um, in the name of, uh, again, trying to maintain a right that we still actually have. Yes, it's extremely terrifying, I think. And when you add the layer of racism and racial stereotypes and, uh, and the way in which Black people are policed in particular to this surveillance state that's being created. And you have to remember that these incentives also push people to report suspicions. They don't have to necessarily have absolute proof, not that that would be justifiable, but in a, in a situation like that, people will be pushed to report just suspicions of people. And we know that who is considered suspicious and, and who is considered deserving of being reported on. We already have evidence in so many other places, including reproductive health, yes. that Black women in particular get reported based on suspicions that they are doing something wrong. So uh, that that's another layer to this, that adds to the, the dangerous situation we're in. I'd, I'd love to turn now that this issue of racism has come up in our conversation, I'd like to focus more on it. Uh, I in, in the introduction to my book, Killing the Black Body, I tell the story of a black man who came up to me angry after I gave a talk about reproductive justice at a local church. And he said to me, why are you advocating about abortion? That's a white woman's issue. And, you know, we've seen throughout U.S. history and today that racism and white supremacy have always been at the heart of assaults on reproductive freedom, whether we're talking about bans on abortion or forced sterilization. Uh, a decade ago, an anti-abortion organization launched a nationwide campaign that accused black women of committing genocide against black people by having abortions. And they put up a giant billboard with an image of a little black girl that said, the most dangerous place for an African-American is in the womb. In fact, Planned Parenthood was a target of this nationwide campaign because these anti-abortion organizations claimed that it was part of this conspiracy against Black people. And I, I would really love to hear how you respond to these allegations against Black women and against your organization. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, first, just in in full uh, transparency and honesty, even though I was raised by, you know, generations of, you know, what we would now consider Black womanist, you know, um, strong women who lived at the intersection of, of race and gender, my own come, you know, coming of age in, in understanding reproductive freedom and reproductive justice didn't happen till well after uh, I was, uh, you know, until I was largely in, um, in in college and graduate school. And so I could have easily just have been, you know, one of uh, that brother who came up to you after the after lecture and said, hey, wait a minute, you know, like I'm a race woman, we have to talk about this first and what impacts us first. And I remember clearly seeing that billboard um, having, a, you know, uh, graduated uh, from school, uh, teaching political science, walking down the street uh, in New York City, uh, and seeing one of those billboards in this, you know, uh, incredibly posh neighborhood, but down the street from the the uh, West Village Planned Parenthood, and um, you know, and it stopped me in my tracks. I was just so shocked because at first you just see, you know, you know, you see this young, you know, face, and you know, still representation matters, right? You don't know, like, what is she, what is she selling? Like, this is a, a trend. This is over a decade ago. You know, we had didn't have the same. Type of revolution around uh, uh, imagery that we're seeing right now. And I, I got closer and I saw those words and they just cut me through my core. They cut me through my core around just how the choices that Black women make, uh, Black women in particular, um, uh, make our, our, our demonized, you know, whether we have children or not. Um, and, and I think it is that um, the the use of that imagery and the use of these plays on racism and 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 genocide, um, uh, the kind of um, evoking of of history um, and you know and horrors and systematic racism that um, that I think is um, unbelievably um, I don't know what to say like just um, it's just so enraging. I guess is probably where I'm trying to go. It's just it's enraging, and you know, and and you see the kind of um, the impact today of a state like Texas, right? Which, as I described, has the you know the among the most egregious reproductive uh, rights ban on a, abortion right now, and has also imposed the most extreme voting rights. Um, ban, right? They're they're focused on decimating um, and restricting access to voting. And so it, it in some ways it feels like at the same time that politicians are forcing people to continue pregnancies, sending more people in into inequity and debt and poverty, um, they're also the same politicians who are um, trying to uh, force disenfranchisement, to gerrymander us out of representation, to uh, put all of these voting restrictions. And, and it feels like like, um, I don't know, I, I hate to say it, but like the 21st century, you know, version of the three-fifths compromise. Uh, it's like our bodies count when it's politically expedient, um, you know, when they need to shape a political map. But they are silencing our voices when we, they, you know, um, when we need to be vocal now. And so, like, it, it's, it's, it's never about... Um, you know, uh, not never just about abortion. When we're talking about racism. It's about the intersection of all of these things, and the and the particular demonization of Black women's um, decision making um, around uh, around what we do and how we claim ownership of our bodies. Yes, I think that's so well said, and that explains the seeming contradictions of policies that ban abortion, but at the same time are also more and more taking away whatever public resources there were to take care of children. Uh, and in some cases, pushing Black women, even coercing uh, and force of, forcing Black women, Indigenous women, uh, immigrant women to be sterilized. There's also been exposés of sterilization abuse going on in prisons and detention centers. And it, they seem to be contradictory until you realize that they all have this common theme, which is to devalue Black women's autonomy and decision-making, yeah. uh, whether, whether it's through sterilization abuse or whether it's through shaming Black women for seeking abortion services. It yeah, that part, all that shaming tactic. 
Yes. No, that part, the shaming, that's what it's about. It's about shaming so they can introduce the stigma and, and insinuate essentially at our core that we can't make our own decisions, right? Yes. And, and that we shouldn't be trusted, right? And so that is actually the Planned Parenthood response, right? That is the, the response of the reproductive justice community. That is the response that we have to hold up, right? Like, do you trust Black women to make decisions about their bodies, right? <laughs> do you trust us to make decisions about our own freedom? And if you don't trust us here, like where else do you not trust us? Because it's never again just about our bodies. To your point, it is uh, it, it, that that may be the animating idea, but the set of policies and the restrictions that then also rise up to justify and criminalize our bodies, uh, criminalize motherhood, criminalize pregnancy, criminalize miscarriage. When you were yeah. talking about surveillance, right? I mean, like, how do you enforce uh, an SB8 ban? You know, do you, are you tracking down what's happening after a miscarriage? How, do, how is that not a, a complete invasion of, uh, of, of, of privacy um, that is only allowed because our bodies have been so dehumanized that they uh, allow the public spectacle of, uh, of, of our most challenging grief, right? Um, that to me is, 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 so, is so much a part of, of the, the kind of weapons of war that they use um, in this way. Absolutely. Well, that's what got me into the reproductive justice movement back in the late 1980s, before the term was coined, was my opposition to the prosecutions of Black women who were pregnant and used drugs. And I thought that those prosecutions that involved dragging women out of maternity wards, putting pregnant women into jails, that all of that had to do with a longstanding devaluation of Black women's childbearing and their reproductive decisions. So speaking of that, there are women today who are in prison be, for having a stillbirth uh, with allegations that they caused the stillbirth to take place. Uh, women who have babies and experience miscarriages uh, are also being charged with fetal crimes. And some women have even been charged with homicide. And I, I think you use the word criminalization. I think we can fairly say that pregnancy itself is being criminalized. And people are now recognizing, I think you have to recognize that whether it's criminalizing people for having an abortion or for having a stillbirth and miscarriage, it's basically the same kind of policy and form of oppression against pregnancy across the board. And I wonder if you've thought about these developments and how they're related to the right to abortion and to reproductive justice more broadly. You know, why, why are we seeing these assaults on access to abortion at the same time that we're seeing prosecutions for fetal crimes uh, and even homicide for stillbirths. Yeah, I mean, look, I think that um, it is, you know, again, I, it is the criminalization uh, of abortion, the criminalization of pregnancy and miscarriage is also the criminalization of motherhood. Uh, the criminalization of of, of maternity um, mm -hmm. when you when you really expand the um, the the lack of infrastructure of health infrastructure um, and and economic infrastructure to support delivery um, as well as uh, as well as the ability to raise a child and I think that to me those core elements um, that um, you know have, have been so core to the reproductive justice movement which was founded 25 years ago by black women who understood the intersection of race and gender in this way um, you know I think are the are the are the ways in which we you know we need to kind of put the the um, spotlight on that this has been happening as you as you well know and write about like you know for 400 years longer right this is not something that started um in the last decade even though we are we are feeling it more intensely and a broader group of people around black women are feeling it more intensely um but that uh, intense criminalization um, is, uh, you know, um, the boldness and the brazenness with which these, um, you know, uh, the the kind of freedom, the freedom of white supremacy that's operating right now, I think, is what is allowing 
um, the this kind of um, intersection happened so so clearly and so publicly, right? I mean, we were talking about the forced sterilization in ICE detention centers in Georgia just last year, right? I mean, we are, um, you know, uh, and, and that directly connects to, um, you know, the ways in which the state uh, was, uh, was forcing, you know, um, separation of, of families uh, at the border um, in in Texas, and so the 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 ways in which we kind of um, you know we have we have dehumanized communities um, has just allowed us to uh, create these policies that um, again don't, are are not um, you don't see uh, communities that sit at the at the kind of in the in the majority um, sense uh, experience because um, um, you you can only you, you can only do these kinds of dehumanizing things if you've actually stripped away the humanity of the community. Yes, I, I think that's such a good point, how this is a confluence of not only political policies that are based in white supremacy and give power to the, the forces that would want to deny these freedoms, but also rooted in an ideology of white supremacy about who deserves to have human rights, who deserves to be treated like an equal human being. It really gets down to that very profound level. And mm -hmm. I also like how you've tied together then the restrictions on access to abortion with the criminalization of pregnancy and maternity, and also with the lack of support for taking care of children and even government intervention in people's ability to take care of children. Now, my, my recent work is about the racism in the child welfare system. And you mentioned uh, separation of children from their families at the border. Uh, we could also look at the separation of children from their families in Black communities. So uh, yes. reproductive justice, as you said, is about the right to have a baby, the right not to have a baby, and the right to raise yes. your children, right, in a just and supportive uh, society. So um, yeah. All Maybe of that is, yeah. is important. Mm -hmm. totally. I'm sorry to, to, to cut you off, but I but the yeah. but in Texas, I mean, you know, this is a state where I think there are half a million children in foster care system, right? I mean, so um, you know, un, under one banner of you know of of arguing about the the sanctity and dignity of 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 life, and then to see actually the the real value, right? Because that's actually where we understand um, how how lives are truly valued is what kind of structures and resources are we putting around them to ensure that they uh, they truly are able to uh, to thrive and and survive um, in the society, and it's you know it. it Again, it it comes back to you know the the um, the white supremacy has its its very strong origins in the in the sexual reproductive rights movement and in the anti-abortion tactics um, you know for um, you know for the last fifty years as well right and I and I think that we can't have a conversation around what's happening right now without also tying it back to how white supremacy. Um, and the adoption of those ideals by, um, you know, segregationists uh, and evangelicals, um, you know, who were, you know, uh, essentially making deals um, to, uh, to um, you know, further segregation uh, in this uh, in this country um, by, you know, supporting, um, you know, Roe as a as a banner to organize under. You know that it's it's been central to the to the uh, to the opposition movement, and and we can't um, create an inclusive movement until we actually really address uh, some of those structural challenges as well. Yeah, I I absolutely agree with that. I think that's so important. So, thinking about uh, strategies then and how we do oppose these assaults on our freedoms and actually achieve reproductive justice, which is connected to all these other kinds of justices we've been talking about, right? Social justice, voting rights, uh, healthcare more broadly, 
criminal justice or uh, the you know true uh, justice in in America uh, and the the end of criminal injustice. Uh, what strategies would you propose in this current legal and political landscape? And how is Planned Parenthood reimagining its role for today? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ooh. Well, <laughs> let me <laughs> start by, um, uh, you know, again, going back to your, your original question around what, what, what's at stake and what's happening, which is that um, uh, if Roe is false, you know, or rendered meaningless um, because the decision um, goes back to states that now feel emboldened to push, you know, 15 week restrictions up to six week to, you know, to zero, you know, to all restriction. Um, we know now that there are 12 states that have trigger bans, um, which means that the state could try to enforce immediately. Uh, nine states have pre row bans on abortion, which would mean that uh, they may have the ability to push more restrictions. Um, and then, as I mentioned earlier, 26 states that are are either have legislative sessions, houses that are ra raring to go. Um, they're introducing copycat laws like the ones we see in Ohio. I mean, in uh, Texas, they're introducing them in Ohio, Pennsylvania, Florida. Um, but we know that they disproportionately in the South and Midwest access um, will be even more limited. Roe was, you know, as our reproductive justice colleagues say, is the floor, right? It was already a right in name only because um, there were a lot of places where there were abortion deserts you know, just because of the lack of abortion provision. So um, so how do we fight that, right? Um, I've already said we don't have the courts, um, you know, the uh, under Trump and McConnell, you know, over 200 justices uh, were uh, appointed. Um, with extreme hostile views that have shaped um, a number of the district and appellate courts already, as well as the Supreme Court. So we're looking federally. Um, the Senate needs to pass the Women's Health Protection Act. Uh, we have been calling on uh, on Leader Schumer to um, to bring the vote to the floor this month, and we think that's a really critical step forward. The Women's Health Protection Act would help address some of these bans by um, um, uh, by bringing review um, for, uh, to Congress, allowing them to review these bans to see whether or not they were compliant uh, with the Constitution. Um, we've seen the Biden administration do some, um, you know, some heavy lifting with us. They just lifted the restrictions on medication abortion, which I think was a huge step forward. Um, it's still out of reach for many people um, in a lot of states that are, you know, racing to pass um, you know, legislation to, to restrict access, but those are going to start to shape the dynamics of how people access care. Um, but the reality is the fight is going to go state by state now, right? If, if Roe is overturned, if Roe falls with the work that we need to do and the work that we've, we've always needed to do is actually shore up state by state, city by city, um, to, uh, really focus on the importance of governors, um, coming up, um, and particularly in this cycle, uh, the state legislatures, um, hold, you know, ensuring that we are holding them accountable. Um, you know, in a in a state like Pennsylvania, you have an incredible champion um, with Josh Shapiro, who is sitting uh, in the governor's office, filling the shoes of uh, of Governor Wolf. Um, and um, and it's really important that in states that um, have uh, leaders that are willing to push the boundaries, that they actually focus on expanding access to care because the surge out of the South and the Midwest into states that um, have more favorable um, conditions for care uh, is still gonna be tremendous. So, so pushing the imagination, I think as, as an organizer, as I was trained, you know, the, one of the most powerful organizing tools you have is, is um, imagination, is it the ability to export imagination to the other parts of the country to help people uh, understand um, what's, uh, what's going on. Um, you know, our top, and I'm just locating because of where you are, although I know all, you know, folks um, have tentacles all around the country, but, but I do think it's, you know, our um, Pennsylvania is incredibly important because we have a, 
you know, we have to defeat um, constitutional amendment legislation that could amend Pennsylvania's constitution and take away state protections for abortion. So I think really understanding what is happening on the state level is the most important thing. And, you know, we could always help plug in to uh, Planned Parenthood Pennsylvania advocates for anyone who wants to do that, to do that work. Um, but I think some of our biggest barriers right now are, um, I would say apathy and exhaustion. <laughs> If I might, um, we've been fighting this fight for a very, very long time. And, um, you know, the, the, um, there's been a gap, I think, between those of us who are saying, you know, Roe is going to fall someday. And those are like, yeah, it'll never happen. You know, yeah, Trump was horrible and all these things, but he's not he's not going to let that happen. He's just going to, you know, make rich people richer, you know, like he doesn't really care about what happens to access. Um, and the truth is, it doesn't matter what he cares about. What matters is that, um, you know, under the last administration um, in particular, but really ushered over the last 10 years, um, the, the ways in which these, uh, these state houses have been remade have put so many different um, rights at risk whether it is voting, um, access to abortion, you know, climate, um, you know, immigration, all of these things are sitting at an intersection. Um, and at Planned Parenthood, we, we have to sit, at, we, we sit with our patients at the kind of intersection of their lives and their injustices and think about how do we fight kind of holistically around those. Um, but we're, we're going to need people in the streets, right? We're going to need people, um, you know, understanding even, even as exhausted as, as, as folks are, um, you know, uh, we need to, to, to have the energy um, to demonstrate to folks in every, um, you know, capital city, uh, what's at stake right now. Yeah, that's, that's very true. We need that kind of on the ground organizing. I, I wondered in, in closing, if you might say something about this reimagining uh, and whether you have a reimagined vision for Planned Parenthood, especially in light of the criticism uh, about the history of Planned Parenthood, its links to eugenics very early on that keeps rearing up again and again, as you know, we mentioned in talking about those billboards and the way in which Planned Parenthood has been targeted. Uh, what what can you tell us about your vision for the organization and its role in the broad movement for reproductive justice? Yes, I mean, I um, you know, uh, earlier or I guess last year um, in in April, I I wrote an op-ed uh, about Margaret Sanger, uh, who is uh, Planned Parenthood's founder. Um, uh, in an attempt to 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 force a, our, our own internal reckoning um, uh, in 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 this conversation, the the opposition has kind of weaponized her history, her association with uh, the eugenics movement as a way to undermine and undercut the critical life saving services that we um, provide. Um, and I wanted to 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 name that you know, like any institution that is over a hundred years old. Uh, there, a rec there's reckoning to be done, right? That um, she was not a perfect leader. She was certainly uh, someone who believed fervently in, uh, you know, in self determination and bodily autonomy as a as a key to get there. Um, but she also had some significant. Um, you know, blind spots when it came to uh, sterilization testing in Puerto Rico, for example. And so that it's possible for us to actually claim our history and own our history and also use it as a, as a way to interrogate how we as an in institution would, would move forward. You know, I didn't want to just rip her name off of a building or a ward or, you know, um, you know, distance myself and say she was 100 years ago without recognizing the fact that um, in many ways she was still operating inside of our own walls. You know, in fact, kind of my initial thought coming into it was, um, you know, Margaret Sanger is like Karen's godmother. 
you know, she is someone who is relentlessly pursuing, you know, um, you know, uh, gender equality, um, but has, you know, at, at best significant blind spots and in, in, in how to do that, you know, and at worst, you know, holding, um, you know, an, an, an ideology around race that reinforces the hierarchy. And so the work moving forward, and I'm, I, I'm, I'm, you know, um, you know, coming into 22 really is, is, is forcing this clarity. Um, I'm wrestling with, with two things. One, how to bring, you know, um, you know, how to continue to interrogate that legacy and 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 center equity, um, decenter whiteness in some ways to actually help create uh, a more expansive, inclusive movement, intergenerational movement. And what does that mean to be a bit of a bridge, but also be very clear about the bet that we are making on um, on leadership of color of um, you know, centering our patients' voices who are predominantly uh, of color um, in many of these areas, and ensuring that 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 they are helping you know us um, you know drive the 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 work forward based on what they need. Um, and then I'm also reckoning with what does it mean to be a black woman presiding over you know potentially the end of Roe, you know, and what does that mean for us as a movement when we are no longer defending. Uh, what we might both argue is not great jurisprudence to begin with, right? We're no longer defending Roe. We're no longer defending, um, you know, gestational weeks, uh, privacy and burden, but we are reimagining where equality really sits inside of the constitution uh, and not just for women, right? But for uh, the, the communities that are, are affected by this, this right. Um, and that, you know, is exciting, actually, in some ways. It is um, the, the ability to, um, uh, to, to, to vision and, and, and think um, at, a, at, you know, what is our, you know, 20-year uh, plan, our strategy to, um, to, to bet on ourselves um, that, that we will uh, regain a right that will be, um, you know, uh, one that will sustain and remain. Um, and I think that's the same bet that we need to make around our democracy, um, that, you know, we will, um, you know, be uh, in, in order to, to make the constitution real, um, we, we need to actually center the right voices who have never really been included in the conversation. Yeah, th thank you for that. I think that is a wonderful way to end our conversation. I think it's so true that these crises are what force us to reimagine how our society is organized and the way in which we should be caring for each other and move past the failed approaches and think about approaches that will lead to true equality and freedom for everybody. And so thank you for ending us on that note. I really appreciate this conversation. It was so wide ranging and enlightening. And uh, you ended with a, a note of hope and a call to action. So uh, thank you so much for that. Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, now what I'd like to do is formally, but unfortunately virtually present you with a recognition of your work. And I want to read the words on the award that you will receive from the University of Pennsylvania Center for Africana Studies. So here goes. The Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Lecture in Social Justice Award is presented to Alexis McGill Johnson for your tireless dedication and unyielding commitment to social justice. January 25th, 2022, the University of Pennsylvania. And it ends with a quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. The moral arc of the universe bends at the elbow of justice. So thank you so much again and congratulations on your award. Thank you, it's such an honor. And thank you to everyone who joined us today for the 2022 Dr. Martin Luther King lecture by the wonderful Alexis McGill Johnson. Take care, everyone.